Hi, and welcome to our fourth video in the Field Server Quick Start series brought to you by Sierra Monitor Corporation. My name is Mac, and today I'd like to walk through a basic Field Server configuration file with you in detail so that we can take the time to understand each section of the configuration file and what it represents. This video is applicable to both the Field Server X30 and the Quick Server products, but excludes configuration of easy gateways as we do that very differently. Before continuing with this video, you may want to ensure you have watched our third video in this series which discusses configuration concepts for a field server. As a refresher, for those who have watched the video, I will begin with a recap of what was discussed so that it is fresh in our memory. This slide from the third video depicts the configuration file components in pictorial fashion. In this example, we defined a client-side connection that was Modbus RTU, and on that connection, we had to specify standard connection parameters, such as port used, board rate, and parity. We then declared the Modbus devices being communicated to in the client-side node section. Our last step on the client side was to use map descriptors to map data from the Modbus devices to the field server data arrays. Once all Modbus data was mapped into the data arrays, we turned our attention to the server side, where we represented each of the data points in the data arrays as a BACnet point by first defining the BACnet connection, then setting up standard BACnet device instances, and finally using server side map descriptors to represent each data array point as a BACnet object instance in one of the device instances. Before going into the detail of the configuration, please note that we are looking at a file that is written in CSV file format. This format can be read in both text editors and spreadsheet packages like Microsoft Excel, which is the most popular tool for doing this configuration. So the first part of the file that actually gets read by the field server is down here in the bridge section. Now all of our sections are laid out pretty much the same way. You have a title followed by the next row where the keywords are laid out and then finally we have the uh, parameters for the keywords. So in this case our title refers to a section, uh, the bridge section, which is our general section that will allow you to put in information about the field server. In this case we're putting a title to the field server and we're calling that this field server field server 11 and we're giving it a system address of 11 which some protocols need and others do not. Before we start moving on to the more meaningful sections, let's just talk about what you can and cannot do in terms of laying out a section in the configuration file. Now one of the things you cannot do is leave a row between the title and the keywords. The field server will not like that and will basically create an error when it sees that. You can, however, if you just delete that line, let's get rid of that, you can, however, have a line between the keywords and the parameters if you prefer to do so. Also the order of the keywords is not important. We could have had system address first and then title. It would not have mattered to the field server. The field server reads the keywords in and then it goes to the next line and reads the parameters in in the same order. You may be asking yourself how do you know which keywords you have in each of these sections and the basic answer to that question is it is documented in the field server configuration manual as well as all the field server driver supplements we have. So for uh, general parameters your field server configuration manual is going to help you out and then of course for each communications driver each driver has its own specific keywords that it needs populated and so you will refer to the field server driver manuals related to the configuration that you're doing to get all of that information. Now it's not that taxing um, what you do need to understand is that when a field server gets shipped to you, it also gets shipped with a default configuration file included. So if you fetch a configuration file from the field server, you're not going to be starting with a blank spreadsheet. You'll be starting with a, a spreadsheet somewhat like this, which already has suggested keywords in it. Let's move on. In our configuration concept diagram, we started with defining the client-side connections, but before we get there, the first thing you're going to want to do in a configuration file is declare all of the data arrays that you would like to use. 
Now, our data rays, as you recall, is our storage area where we basically store all the information that we need um, for the application. So all the data that gets read in by Modbus is going to get stored into data rays, and then we will turn around and we'll serve those uh, data points up as backnet points. So our data storage tanks need declaration. We need to do it in the configuration file, and this gives us flexibility to um, set up the data rays the way we want them. For basic data rays, the three things we need to declare are its name, uh, the data format that we're storing the data in, and how many data points we're going to be able to put into each data array. So uh, in terms of uh, cap capacity, you can set up data rays to be any length. You can also have as many data rays as you want. So you have a lot of flexibility in deciding how you want to set your data rays up. And this is totally user defined, as you can see. So for this application, uh, in this configuration, we've set up three data rays and uh, each of them have 200 data points each and the first two data rays we're going to store floating point format values in other words we're going to store values into each of the data ray locations that will be stored as a floating point we don't necessarily store floating point values into the data ray you may for example take a binary value store it into a floating point data ray but it's going to be saved as a floating point value and the third data ray um, is a bit data array. It's a binary data array where you can only store binary data. It wouldn't make sense to store anything else. And so that's either a zero or one, but uh, we have 200 locations available in that. And by doing these three lines over here, we're basically setting up our storage areas and we can use these areas further down in the configuration file. Note that data arrays don't have to be completely used up. Um, you can create a data array of length 200 and only use 100 of the points. It doesn't matter. What you're doing with the declaration of the data arrays is just providing the storage area. Later in the configuration, you will basically decide which part of the data arrays you will actually use. And so finally, we move on to client-side connections. Now, in this example, our client-side connection is a Modbus TCP connection where we're going out to a gas sensor and we're fetching the data from the gas sensor and we're storing it into the data arrays we've just declared. So in order to do that, the first thing we need to do is define our connection. Now, it's an Ethernet connection and so the adapter we will use is N1. We have uh, labels for each of our ports in Field Server. Um, the serial ports for RS-232 are labeled P1 and P2. The RS-485 ports are labeled R1 and R2. And our Ethernet ports are labeled N1 and N2. Now when we define our connection, we also have to define our protocol, in this case Modbus TCP. And in this example, we have also defined the optional parameter poll delay as well, which helps us throttle communications with the Modbus TCP network. Now, once we've finished defining the connections, we will move on to define the nodes, which are the devices that we are communicating with. And in this case, we are defining a node called sensor one, which happens to be unit ID one, at IP address 192.168.2.22 um, and again we define protocol and the adapter that we're communicating through. So by setting up this node we have set up the path to communicate to sensor 1. This brings us to the workhorse of the configuration which is the client-side map descriptor section. In the client-side map descriptor section we're mapping all of the data from sensor 1 into data arrays. So the way you want to read uh, the lines that are here is to start on in the middle basically towards the right hand side and we read go to sensor 1, fetch Modbus address 40,001 for a length of 30 so we're fetching 30 variables every 0.2 seconds that's a scan interval and we use a function called RDBC I'll get back to that and we're going to store the data in the data array called S1 state starting at offset 0. Now um, you have 30 data points that we're bringing in so we will start storing the values in offset 0 but because there's 30 data points that we're bringing in we will actually populate offset 0 through offset 29 in the data array called S1 state.
Now this is where some people might have some difficulty visualizing what we're actually trying to do here. So I'll try and demonstrate by way of an example using the cells in the spreadsheet. We have declared a data array which we call S1 state and that data array has uh, multiple locations, 200 in fact, uh, that we can actually store data in. So if we uh, show the data array offsets in the cells here, our first data array offset is offset 0 and then we can go down all the way down to 199 but I will just show the ones that I can fit on the page here so we have offsets 0 through 37 and what we've done in the instruction in the map descriptors we've said store address 40001 in offset 0 so we'll do that and then store the next 30 values consecutively so we're going to store all the values all the way down to offset 29 and we're going to have off, uh, addresses 40,001 through 40,030 going into our data array. So if we were looking for a value from register 40,013, for example, then we would find it in S1 state offset 12. Now going forward in the configuration, we will no longer reference Modbus registers because all of our data is stored in the data arrays, and so we'll be referencing data array offsets to get our data. Let's just focus quickly on the function field that we jumped over. Uh, this field is used to tell us exactly how we want to actually fetch the data. So RDBC uh, stands for read block continuously and it also has implicit in it write on change. But we have different functions in the field server to help us um, either write or read data or be passive and wait to be read. So the main functions are RDBC which reads data continuously. We have WRBX which writes data on change. We have WRBC which writes data continuously. And then we have a function called server which you'll find on the backnet side. It is a, fu a passive function which basically does nothing. It waits to be pulled. It waits for data to be fetched and then responds with data. Now that we have all the values in the data arrays, it's time to move over to the server side where we will declare all of the backnet information we need to represent all of the data array values as backnet data points. So we start on the server side connections. Once again, we have to define a connection. And once again, because this is an Ethernet protocol, we're defining N1, but we choose a protocol of backnet IP. Now this might be confusing to some that we can use the same connection N1 for both Modbus TCP and BACnet IP but you need to remember that each of these communication protocols have their own logical ports. BACnet defaults to 47808, Modbus defaults to 502 so they can operate on the same port without any problem. Once again, once the connection is defined, we can move down to the server side nodes where we declare the device that we are going to represent. In this case, it's a BACnet device that we're representing with a name and a node ID. And the node ID in BACnet is actually known as device instance. And so uh, we have our device instance declared with the name and the name will actually be displayed in BACnet as well because that's a property of BACnet. So once we have a node, ID declared we can move on to the server side map descriptor section which is the final part of representing points in BACnet. So our mapping in BACnet uh, starts on the left hand side here and we define a name for each of our points and then we define which data array offset the data point exists in and then that's function that we just discussed server that's passive we will wait for the, the point to be polled and we will respond with the point data and then we're stating that it is on field server 11 device instance 11 and then we say we're going to represent it as data type AI object ID 1 which is a backnet address and the present value is what we have inside of the data array. Then in backnet we also have the ability to specify units and then there's some scaling which we're not going to discuss in this video but we can scale the value as well if we want to. And then you're done. You have a backnet point which is now coming from the Modbus side through the data array and we're representing it as a backnet object instance. Before we wrap up there's just a few points that we might like to take note of. In this configuration you might have noticed that we brought in 30 data points from the Modbus side but on the server side we're only representing two backnet points and the question is is that a problem? The answer is no. If you're not 
bringing out all of the points that you actually brought into the field server that's not an issue there might be a good reason why you're doing that but the field server will let you do it that's not an issue at all the second point to take note of is that this is a basic configuration with just the basic features of just transferring data straight from one side to another and your typical configuration file will probably have a few more features than this inserted into it. So be on the lookout if you're looking at more complicated configurations for sections like the move section which allow us to move data from one data rate to another. Um, you can just move data or you can actually perform operations on the data when you move it like scaling or uh, in some cases creating 32-bit values out of 16-bit values or performing some logic on data all of this is possible within the field server and these are all fields that you can add into your configuration to do what you need um, you also have other special features like special data arrays that will tell you whether or not a device is communicating to the field server or not so um, these are all advanced features of the field server and they're there for you to use and if you go to the field server configuration manual you can read up about all of those but um, that's beyond the scope of this uh, particular video and perhaps we'll do a video on that in the future but uh, for this for now what you need to know is that there is more that you can put into a configuration file and most configuration files you look at will have a bit more than this and that is the end of this quick start presentation. Please like us below if you found this useful and let us know in the comments if there are any features or functions you'd like to see a video on. Thank you and all the best with your field server application.